thank you for first of all for the kind invitation it's really nice to to, to speak uh, to this wonderful audience i actually spent uh, two years uh, uh, at the Institute of, of Physics. Uh, I was at the University of Edinburgh. I actually moved to uh, the Wrocław University of Technology um, this year, recently. So I was uh, in Edinburgh um, as an independent researcher, and then many elements uh, drove uh, me and my family actually to, to move back to Poland. But I'm really glad to be here, and I was really happy to receive uh, your invitation, uh, because it's, uh, I mean, the University of Warsaw is, is, is an outstanding institution in terms of uh, uh, the researchers um, who do very exciting work there. So um, I'm really pleased to, to, to have the chance today. Uh, okay, so I'll just uh, make it full screen. Do you see uh, my uh, title slide? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm a computational chemist, but I am uh, largely interested in uh, uh, the origins of RNA and DNA, or more broadly speaking, in prebiotic chemistry. Uh, so what we do are mainly applications, but what we do as well to actually do these applications uh, thoroughly and get some good interpretations of uh, the experimental side of things. We, we also try to develop computational protocols. So we, we, we try to find uh, accurate ways to actually get specific values like uh, reaction rates or, or to understand the mechanisms uh, more precisely. Uh, so speaking of the origins of RNA and DNA, it's been actually a challenge to understand it uh, for many, many years. And uh, the whole field has something like 100 years, actually, altogether, starting from, from Operin, the Russian researcher who had the ideas about the role of reducing atmosphere in the formation of biomolecules and biomolecular building blocks. Uh, and although we managed to solve many issues that Operin had in mind, and also his followers had had in mind later on, we are still facing formidable challenges, especially when it comes to the formation and the origins of nucleic acids, uh, which are which are informational polymers and basically which encode the information about the composition of proteins, or more broadly speaking, about uh, the way all living organisms look and, and work. Uh, so one of these challenges is uh, outlined here, as you see, and this is simply the formation of nucleosides or, or even nucleotides. So a nucleotide has also a phosphate group here at the five prime uh, uh, oxygen or at the three prime oxygen. Uh, and the, this part, this sugar and, and phosphate is, is necessary uh, for the backbone. Uh, so it turns out this very simplistic modular approach, which, uh, which is very intuitive to, uh, to us, like starting from sugars, nucleobases and, and phosphate doesn't really work because it's uh, uh, hindered thermodynamically and, and kinetically. Um, there are other, other ideas and I will show to, to you some of them uh, today. Uh, another problem is we actually don't know what are the prebiotic sources of ribose. So although you can find sugars in meteoritic materials, although you can actually synthesize sugars prebiotically, uh, the key problem is how to selectic, selectively um, generate specific, specific stereoisomers and enantiomers even. So if we just think about stereoisomers, there are many various types of uh, uh, pentose sugars and just uh, invert the orientation of the OH at the two prime or three prime, and you get a different sugar, which actually behaves differently. And it, it doesn't, it, it isn't uh, RNA any longer. So if you just invert to the two prime OH, you get ANA, which is arabinose uh, nucleic acid. Um, so that's another question. Another question is actually when you get these building blocks is how you polymerize them. And finally, I mean, even if you polymerize them, uh, we assume that actually, well, we know that we need nucleic acids to, be, to build proteins. So the assumption is at the advent of life, at the, at the time when first biomolecules were formed, there were no uh, functional proteins which could actually 
uh, very efficiently uh, replicate nucleic acids. So they had to do this activity somehow themselves. And then some molecular evolution drove it further to, towards the enzymatic part of the world. So the question is how these nucleic acid oligomers could have copied themselves. And th again, there are some ideas, but we, we still really haven't solved the whole part of the problem. Uh, and I will speak about this very briefly in the end, because that's the plan for our future research, whereas I will focus on actually on the formation of, of building blocks and on the role of ultraviolet light, as you will see uh, in a moment. But all of these challenges, they actually uh, resulted in, in the suggestion of various alternative uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, so since there were problems in forming the RNA building blocks, uh, some groups started thinking, okay, maybe there are some other types of uh, informational polymers, which uh, at first played some important role during the formation of uh, uh, biomolecular machineries, during the formation of first protocells. And then they were replaced by RNA, which, which probably is, is functionally much more uh, efficient and, and just better. Uh, and uh, here you can just see these differences in terms of different backbones. Uh, but there were also many ideas, uh, including alternative nucleobases. Uh, so these alternative nucleobases, uh, so different uh, aminopurines or uh, different forms of, of xanthine and uh, hyposanthine were found of carbonaceous, were found in carbonaceous meteorites. Uh, others were formed in model prebiotic reactions, also including nucleosides um, and uh, some other type of nu nucleobases like these. So. Uh, this triaminopyrimidine uh, and barbituric acid were actually formed to were actually shown to to to, to enable spontaneous glycosylation, so connection to the sugar. And this is just a part of the whole world of the ideas. So the, the question now arises: actually, we have so many of these thoughts, and probably not all of them, and if any, actually rather few of them played any role uh, in the prebiotic era. So the, the question is how to reduce the prebiotic clutter, the, pre, the, the clutter that we actually create, created ourselves uh, when uh, proposing hypotheses about the emergence of uh, biomolecular building blocks. So one of the clues um, is very likely uh, ultraviolet light. And uh, the reason is, is fairly simple. Uh, first of all, uh, young stars are somewhat bluer. Uh, so they emit more light uh, or slightly more light in the ultraviolet spectral range. Uh, so that's, th that's true for, um, for the young sun. And there are also flares, which, which actually likely enabled the chemistry. And another uh, element of the whole story is uh, actually there was no molecular oxygen uh, in the atmosphere of the early Earth. Uh, so there was basically no shielding in the range of 200, uh, well, 210 to 300 nanometers. And these uh, wavelengths can actually do a lot of uh, useful, but also destructive photochemistry. So ultraviolet light could have been an important source of energy. Uh, for early prebiotic reactions, but also a crucial selection factor because it not only enables uh, photochemical transformations, it also uh, destroys many organic molecules and chromophores. And uh, some of previous hypothes hypotheses actually uh, took a lot from uh, okay, took a lot from uh, from this. Uh, and they suggested uh, that likely A, T, G, and C, so the nucleobases, they were selected based on their photostability. So what we are trying to show in our research is that it is actually not that simple. Uh, it's much more complex. And although there is some connection between the photostability of these nucleobases in the gas space, it's, not, it's unlikely to be the main reason. It's probably something else that really mattered. Uh, during the emergence of biomolecules. Um, 
there are some more important things to say about uh, the conditions on our planet uh, in the Archean. Uh, so although we had no oxygen, there was still uh, some CO2 and H2O in the atmosphere, and that very efficiently attenuated uh, wavelengths below um, 204 nanometers. But if you just look at this graph and at the green and blue trace, uh, these show how UV light that uh, was emitted by the young sun was attenuated by the atmosphere. So the there was some attenuation, but it wasn't significant. Actually, there was much more UV light reaching the surface uh, than nowadays. And if we just think in terms of fairly clean water, um, it could still easily penetrate uh, to the depth of one meter. Um, so simply speaking, it could induce some photochemistry, even aqueous photochemistry. Um, occasionally, the photochemistry could have been um, enhanced by flares. Uh, well, OK, and that's something they also mentioned about the penetration and um, penetration of, of superficial lakes. Uh, or some small water reservoirs. Uh, so when we uh, look at the excited state lifetimes of isolated nuclear bases, uh, that's actually the clue that I mentioned uh, before. We see that uh, guanine, adenine, uracil, cytosine, and thymine, they exhibit very short excited state lifetimes. Uh, which can be directly related to their photostability, because the shorter the molecule lives as a reactive pyradical in the excited state, the lower the chance of inducing uh, photodestructive chemistry or, or bimolecular reactions. Uh, and when we look at some alternative nuclear bases, it actually turns out that the lifetimes are uh, orders of magnitude longer. Uh, so these measurements, uh, were suggested as one of the key clues, uh, and uh, definitely the the whole information in it is is very is very useful and interesting, and it hints towards the role of UV light. Uh, but there are some things which which uh, uh, weren't taken into account here, and one of them uh, is that even if we pre-select these nuclear bases, uh, with it's it's still a long way to RNA and DNA. And both uh, the sugar, uh, which is ribose in RNA, and water can quite significantly affect the photochemistry. And that's something that we've been studying uh, for quite a long time. And furthermore, uh, actually, the oligomers, which can be formed on the early Earth or under the conditions of the early Earth, uh, they are prone to the, to, to the formation of photo damage, and there are no repairing en enzymes. Uh, so the question is how they could actually survive uh, under these conditions. So that's something that I'll try to answer uh, today. So when we talk about the formation of, of RNA uh, <clears throat> nucleosides, uh, ultraviolet light actually turns out to, to be a very important factor in some specific uh, stages. Of, uh, of these reaction sequences. Uh, so we are particularly focused on, on the approach uh, which, uh, which somewhat bypasses the glycosylation, so the connection uh, of a sugar to a nuclear base. Uh, and in these reaction sequences proposed by the sutherland powner groups, uh, UV light, first of all, drives specific photochemical transformations very efficiently. So this one, which you see here, that's driven by UV light. And uh, uh, that's simply an intermediate, which is non-biological. But when you irradiate it, uh, you can see that it is very efficiently transformed towards the biological form of a nucleoside. And we explained this mechanism uh, already five years ago. And the results were published in 20. Uh, 17 in nature chemistry. And since then, there were some more ideas how to actually complement this, uh, this whole reaction sequence. Uh, so here, as you see, we have just three nucleosides. They're actually pyrimidine nucleosides. So these two are the biological ones. This one was suggested to play an important role during the non-enzymatic RNA template copying. Uh, 
what was missing for a very long time were the purine nucleosides. And only recently, uh, the Sutherland group proposed uh, a possible part of pathway which could complement this work. Uh, and uh, we contributed to another uh, part of the sequence, which uh, included uh, some sulfur derivatives of, of nucleobases and formation of so-called th thionhydronucleosides, um, which, which actually turns out to be a, a very efficient way to form purine DNA. So the caveat is this is a purine DNA nucleoside, this is an RNA nucleoside, but if you take them all together, you actually get all four components, just the sugars are somewhat different. Uh, and that's uh, a scheme which mm, shows this part in more detail. So I know we have many physicists today, so I will try to be very easy on the chemistry and not to spend too much time on it. Uh, so basically all of these compounds, which you see here, even including adenine, uh, or uh, including this uh, thiourea or triaminopyrimidine, they can be formed from very simple one carbon feedstock molecules like HCN, for example. Uh, and uh, a set of reactions can actually drive them towards the formation of these much more complex systems. And many of them actually include photoredox chemistry. So here we have this thion hydronucleoside, which I mentioned before, which has a sulfur and nucleobase part, a sulfur atom and nucleobase part, and the sugar part. And what you really need is just one step of irradiation, uh, and nothing else can actually do it, uh, can, can perform this transformation. And this UV radiation step uh, can lead to the formation of uh, the purine nucleosides. Interestingly, when you look at these reaction pathways, you can imagine, well, there are many byproducts which are formed, especially some non-biological forms or stereoisomers of these nucleosides. And they turned out uh, to be much less photostable. They basically undergo photodegradation under the, the conditions of these reactions. Uh, so what we've been trying to, to explain through uh, all the years uh, was what drives the photochemical selectivity. And as you can see here, uh, we also have actually two forms, the biological and non-biological form of uh, the precursor. But what is most important is that if you irradiate this precursor in specific conditions, you get only the biological form of the nucleoside. If you do the, the chemistry and the photoredox chemistry, so Photoredox basically mean, it means that there is a photoinduced electron transfer. Um, then uh, you can also get the non-biological form of the nucleoside. Uh, but what we are working currently on is that when you expose this product mixture to UV light, then this one is uh, photodestructive. It, it just decomposes, whereas uh, the biological form of the nucleoside prevails. So I'll tell a bit more about the actual mechanisms in a minute and the work that has been done for this article published last year in Nature. Uh, before I go there, I'll just briefly tell how we can actually use quantum chemistry to understand these photochemical reactions and predict uh, photoreactivity. And actually the final part of that question is much more interesting. So explaining uh, mechanisms is largely satisfying our curiosity, but it is still useful to do it because uh, we can do a sanity check on the actual chemistry that is done in the lab. Uh, but the final part of the presentation will be, will be about predicting. Uh, and I'll show you one example of this. Uh, so speaking very, uh, in, in very broad terms, if we want to understand photochemical reactions, we, we need to calculate the potential energy surfaces. And uh, mm, inferring the mechanism from a potential energy surface is very easy for ground state reactions. So you just think in terms of hiking. Uh, so uh, you have your substrates in one valley and you need to go to the products through a saddle point. And the saddle point is the transition state 
And the configuration of these reagents or reactants at the transition state it actually tells you a lot about the mechanism. Uh, it's not that simple in terms of photochemistry, but there is another metaphor which you can use, and this is scheme. Uh, so the difference here is uh, uh, that the molecules get an extra kick of energy when uh, they absorb a UV photon, and uh, you can just compare it to a skiing lift, which takes the skier to the top of the mountain. And then uh, these different endpoints, they actually, you can associate them they, 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 with, with different photo products. Though, so, so they can be connected to, to these different photo products. And it really depends which colors of these routes the skier chooses and which intersection they choose to get to the final point. So now if you think that these different routes are electronic states, excited states in which the molecule is, what really matters is finding these intersection points, which we call conical intersections, when the states uh, which cross have the same multiplicity, or uh, they are simply state crossings into system crossings if the multiplicity is different. Um, so they play a similar role as transition states in determining reaction mechanisms. Uh, but the problem with them is that nuclear and electronic degrees of freedom are strongly coupled. Uh, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which we actually use to construct potential energy surfaces and, and interpret uh, state crossings, breaks down. Uh, so apart from actually trying to solve this problem in time-dependent uh, quantum chemistry and simulate the transitions, well, we also need to uh, think uh, uh, or use a reuse accurate methods which can describe uh, several configurations at the same time, uh, several electronic configurations, like for example, uh, Caspi to do Casa CF or MRCI, which we apply to smaller systems. But when we go to larger systems, we actually move to uh, using uh, methods that uh, take a lot from second order perturbation theory or there are simplified coupled clusters approaches like CC2, ADC2 is, is, is somewhat closer in its uh, ideas to, to MP2, but it's for, exit, for excited states. And then we try to benchmark these approaches against these more accurate methods. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a very simplistic idea, but it actually uh, is a very useful thing to, to consider. Uh, so when we look at the topographies of these uh, uh, conical intersections, uh, what we learn from them tells us a lot about, about the reactivity. So if the topography of most of the conical intersections in, in, in a given organic chromophore uh, is peaked, then it means that the lifetime will be very, very short and the skier can just very easily slide down and come back to, to the uh, to, its, to its ground state form. Uh, however, when the topography is sloped, uh, it actually takes quite a lot, lot of time to get to the state crossing. And in this excited by radical state, some interesting photochemistry can occur. It can be either reactive photochemistry or it can be destructive photochemistry. And that's something that we um, try to determine. Uh, so if we look back at one of the uh, schemes that I showed to you on the previous slides, uh, I can tell you a bit what we did here in order to explain uh, the photochemistry and this photo reduction process. Um, so here we have two different um, photo reducing agents. One of them was uh, bisulfite, so HSO3 minus or the other one was Aegis minus, so sulfide, so both sulfur species. Uh, but they actually uh, demonstrated very different reactivity, even though both are anions and both can generate hydrated electrons. Uh, so the key finding was actually uh, that uh, specific charge transfer complexes can promote electron transfer in these systems, and they can drive selective photoreduction finally leading to the formation of uh, biological form of the nucleoside. Uh, so the work was largely done uh, by Mikołaj Janicki, who, who has been working with me for quite some time already. He's a PhD student 
uh, or finishing soon uh, in our group at uh, uh, Wrocław University of Science and Technology. And what we looked at together uh, were first of all, uh, was first of all the reactivity and the behavior of these thio uh, anhydronucleosides after uh, they uh, attach an electron. And it actually turns out that depending on the orientation of the nuclear base, so here you have uh, the amino group pointing to the right, here the amino group is pointing closer to the sugar packer. So even though the, the system seems very similar, depending on the orientation of this amino group of the nuclear base, you actually get very, very different um, photoreduction or very, very different chemistry driven by the attachment of the electron. Um, now, this can be simply driven by bisulfide, so HSO3 uh, minus, uh, which generates hydrated electrons. Um, when you just irradiate the thioanhydronucleoside in uh, in aqueous environment, the biological precursor can undergo this CS bond rupture on break or breaking, and it just waits to get the electron to, to actually undergo further step of the photoreduction, whereas the non-biological one has a somewhat sloped topography of this conical intersection, and it also undergoes uh, specific puckering of the aromatic part of this ring, as you can see here. Uh, and as we actually observed, when it reaches the conical intersection, the, the, the structure of the aromatic ring is decomposed and it's broken. And then further, uh, this much less stable intermediate uh, undergoes hydrolysis. Uh, when we use bisulfite, which is different, it doesn't have any oxygen as HSO3 minus, it can actually nicely bind to the sulfur here. And when it binds to the sulfur, uh, it can selectively transfer the electron, irrespective of what is the orientation of the nuclear base. So I'll just show this uh, in a closer view. Um, so the distance between the two sulfur atoms is roughly uh, 3.3, 3.4 angstroms. And the interaction that we have is, is called the chalcogen bond. So even though these are two identical atoms, they actually interact quite strongly. They, there is a patch of positive electrostatic potential here on this side. We have an anion here, and this anion very selectively and efficiently transfers the electron. Uh, chalcogen bonding uh, has been very extensively explored in theoretical chemistry in many, many uh, concept, uh, concepts or, or in, in many backgrounds, basically. So uh, it was shown to play a role, for example, in uh, catalysis, in supramolecular catalysis, but also in, uh, um, for example, finding specific uh, drugs interacting with, uh, with uh, uh, active centers of, of enzymes or receptors. Uh, so what we show here is actually a new thing because uh, this is uh, photoreduction, which is induced by chalcogen bonding, which to the best of our knowledge uh, hasn't been discussed so far. So, so it actually can have applications far beyond prebiotic chemistry as we've shown here in, uh, in this work. Okay, so this is one selected story from our uh, works related to uh, understanding the photochemistry uh, leading to RNA and DNA nucleosides. There is more of it, but I, I don't want to spend the whole uh, morning speaking about it. I think that we have some more interesting things to talk about. Um, so let's move further. Uh, and the, the next question that we can ask here is, okay, uh, UV light offers selectivity for prebiotic chemistry. That's something that we've learned from the first part of the presentation. But the question now is how this RNA and DNA oligomers could have been protected from further damage. And it's not really an easy uh, problem to solve. There are some ideas like sunscreening or, for example, um, uh, periods of, of, uh, um, of dark, uh, well, dark periods, basically, which, which could have uh, lowered the importance of photochemistry. Uh, but we have another thought. 
which is actually very much related to, to what biology does, but is somewhat simpler. Uh, so when we look at RNA and DNA and the way it interacts with light, I mean here the polymers, and here we have an example of a, of a double strand, um, especially in the case of pyrimidine nucleobases, uh, light can form so-called dimers, thymine dimers, or cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers, which are the most common uh, photodamages, but there are many more other types of them. And these dimers, they connect the neighboring nucleobases covalently, and they also have a strong effect on the configuration, on the conformation of uh, the sugar phosphate backbone. And essentially, they just uh, um, deactivate many of the biological uh, functions of, uh, of nucleic acids. So what nature does is uh, it, it has currently uh, very sophisticated machinery uh, to uh, repair these uh, lesions and uh, different types of enzymes, which are somewhat similar, they can actually repair different lesions. But this one is one of the most important and uh, it is also believed to be one of the most ancient ones. Uh, so this is a fertilase, which looks or, or uh, scans a, a DNA duplex and finds this specific kink in the backbone and then sucks in the uh, dimerized thymines into the active center. What we have in the active center, so here, is this flavin adenine dinucleotide, uh, which absorbs visible light and can transfer the electron to the TT dimer. So now if you look here at panel C, uh, this is what happens when the TT dimer uh, accepts the electron. Uh, it can simply undergo um, practically barrierless uh, breaking of the cyclobutane connection, which is uh, essentially our lesion. Um, and this process simply restores the canonical structure of the dimer uh, and sends the electron back to, uh, to the flavin adenine dinucleotide. Uh, so although it would be very difficult to, to imagine a similar process happening with uh, a, a protein in the prebiotic world, uh, five years ago, a group from Germany suggested that actually specific sequences uh, can transfer electrons very efficiently uh, and possibly repair TT dimers. So there are attempts to do it in DNA itself. But they weren't so successful, and it turned out that if you take, uh, for example, GATT sequence, uh, this process can be significantly enhanced. And what they got was 25% of cell repairing efficiency. So they don't repair everything, but they can at least repair one fourth of the photodamages in the photostationary state of equilibrium. Uh, and when you compare it for many, uh, too many other. Um, uh, tetramers, like for example TATT, uh, or, or, or trimers or other oligomers, uh, well, the efficiency is much, uh, much lower, or you just get basically no zero yields of, of self-repair, or you, you get even more photo damages. So the, the suggestion that, that they made was, well, perhaps there were specific oligomers which could have been selected uh, on the early Earth by uh, ultraviolet irradiation. Uh, and the problem with, with these experiments, which they did, uh, was that uh, uh, the samples are very expensive. Uh, so micro molar amounts really uh, cost uh, uh, thousands of euros. Uh, so the key thing to be here would be, uh, or the key goal, uh, would be to really understand the mechanism and uh, try to use this knowledge to predict the photoreactivity and propose other oligomers which would be worth studying. And that's something that uh, uh, we aim to do. So we started with this uh, uh, case that we knew that worked with GATT and tried to explain the, the cell repair mechanism uh, in, this, in this particular oligomer. Uh, so what we do um, is somewhat more complex than uh, the work on smaller uh, molecules. 
And one of the first things that we need to look at is actually the conformational space. So uh, the sugar phosphate backbone is very flexible uh, and uh, it, can it can simply have many arrangements uh, in aqueous environment and uh, there is more than several oligomers uh, that can be populated or oligomers, sorry, there is, there is more than several conformers, so various um, rotomers of the molecule speaking a bit differently uh, that can be populated uh, at room temperature in aqueous environment. So what we started with were molecular dynamic simulations with uh, force fields uh, and we acquired um, 10 microseconds for, for each solvent model. We tried two different sol solvent models, clustered the results, and uh, selected uh, the most representative conformers. And then we moved on to electrostatic embedding QMMM calculations. So we used DFT with dispersion correction, which I forgot to, to, to annotate here. Uh, DFTD3 uh, to optimize the structures. Uh, and then we used ADC2 to actually calculate uh, the photochemical properties. So we optimized uh, the structure of the full fragment, not only the nuclear bases, but also the sugar, phosph sugar phosphate backbone with DFT. And then we used ADC2 just for the nuclear bases. And we did sanity checks for the whole uh, sugar phosphate uh, backbone as well. I mean, the, the whole tetranucleotide, but it's quite expensive. So we could only do single point calculations, but I'll show it in a minute, in a minute what are the results of these uh, benchmark calculations. So the reason to use ADC2 is actually that it provides fairly reliable energies and geometries of charge transfer states also outside of the Frank-Condon region. Well, it's not perfect, but it's much more accurate that, uh, than time-dependent DFT, uh, which on the other hand tends to underestimate the energies of CT states uh, and also has some problems in correctly describing the potential energy surfaces beyond the frank Camden region. So here in our case, ADC2 uh, actually worked really nicely. Uh, and we uh, finally also optimized, uh, well, the S1 minima, but also conical intersections, so state crossings. Uh, and these are the two conformers that we looked at in the case of GATT. So one of them uh, fairly resembles BDNA and has the specific arrangements of uh, uh, the GNA nuclear bases in the anti-orientation with respect to the sugar packer, uh, which corresponds to BDNA. Uh, although the population was minor, we thought it would be worth doing it, uh, also for the context of, of longer oligomers, which contain the sequence. Uh, and then we also looked at the one that was most populated, so uh, a bit different, but still stacked uh, GATT uh, conformer. And then the very interesting result of these calculations uh, is that actually the details of the photochemistry are conformer dependent. And this dependence really is related to the way uh, the nuclear bases are aligned. And that also matters a lot uh, uh, for um, the electron transfer rates and also for the relaxation mechanisms of specific components of these oligos. Uh, so when we think about electron hole transport in DNA, especially in canonical DNA, it's actually not so, such an easy thing to induce. Uh, so, first of all, the lower energy range of the spectrum is dominated by locally excited states, such as pi pi star and n pi star states or on specific nuclear bases. And uh, these charge transfer states, which are associated with electron transfer, they are, they are actually quite high in the spectrum. Uh, so you can find them at uh, energies like uh, 5.8, 5.7 electron volts, uh, according to, to what we've calculated, which is uh, really, really uh, far to the blue. So the wavelengths are, are very short and were likely um, shielded on the, on the early Earth, but are also difficult to generate uh, in the laboratory. Uh, so the question uh, is how these CT states could have been populated. Well, probably not directly, because even uh, if we try to do it, they have very low oscillator strengths. 
Um, but somehow the whole self repair mechanism worked, uh, and uh, it was actually even seen at much longer wavelengths, so much lower excitation energies. So if we look at GATT, uh, it actually becomes apparent that these charge transfer states can uh, be populated, but in an indirect manner. So at about 200 nanometers, we um, aim at this low energy absorption shoulder of uh, guanine, so the G base. And uh, if the guanine base has a bit of time to undergo photorelaxation on the excited state potential energy surface, it actually uh, also brings down these charge transfer states lower in energy. And it can populate them. They're just above uh the locally excited state on g and the electron transfer uh brings the energy of the excited state down quite significantly so the key thing is for g to uh, have sufficiently long excited state lifetime in this stacked arrangement to enable the electron transfer and the next step is really the transfer from a minus to the tt dimer and it really doesn't matter where the hole resides, whether it is on, or on G or A. Uh, what we really need is uh, the electron on the TT dimer. And that uh, is sufficient to, first of all, enable the state crossing. And what is actually associated with the state crossing is this partly repaired geometry of uh, the TT dimer with one of the first bonds broken here. And the other bond is broken uh, in the hot electronic ground state uh, of, uh, of this molecule, um, which eventually uh, restores the canonical structure of the thymine bases. Uh, and this is really analogous to the biological mechanism of cell repair by photolyases. Um, I mentioned before that we also did some of the calculations, including the sugar phosphate backbone and not only the nuclear bases at the ADC2 level. And that actually was very important. So when you look now, it seems that the electron transfer is unfavorable uh, and uh, that it would require some excess energy um, after uh, the G base, the excited G base undergoes its initial uh, photorelaxation. Uh, but it actually happens uh, sometimes that this uh, QMMM arrangement, having only the nuclear bases in, in the QM region, uh, leads to artifacts, which is di directly associated with, with um, electric dipole moments of, of these uh, uh, charge transfer states. So if we include, include the full backbone uh, in the QM region, uh, actually, we get a bit more solid values. Uh, so we just always test it and double check it against larger QM regions. And here in this particular case, turns out that this state is much more correctly described when we have the sugar phosphate backbone in the QM region. It's not often the case, but it does happen. So it's good to look at it uh, if you want to calculate uh, photochemistry in QMM. Okay, so the final part of the presentation, uh, I hope I'm not going over time. <laughs> Do I still have some? Probably like five minutes. Okay, so I'll just quickly, quickly jump to it. Uh, so the final part of the presentation is how we can actually use that knowledge to predict uh, uh, photoreactivity. And the question is, could alternative nuclear bases increase DNA self-repair uh, and the yields of the self-repair? So here on the left-hand side, we have a canonical trimer. On the right-hand side, we have a trimer with a modified nuclear base, 2,6-diaminopurine, which I selected based on ionization potentials, which I just calculated for various purines. And if we look at the energies of the excited states, first of all, the spectrum, the absorption spectrum is somewhat redshifted when compared to the canonical one. But what's most important, the charge transfer state is lowered in energy by practically one electron volt just by adding one amino group to uh, adenine. Uh, so 2 6 dimethylpyrene is a very interesting molecule, uh, which can actually very efficiently promote electron transfer, as you see here on the left-hand side of the, of the scheme. 
uh, while itself, it doesn't immediately photorelax to the electronic ground state. And this is also an advantage in a way, even though it seems itself a bit less photostable, it is slightly less photostable than adenine or adenosine. Uh, this longer time in the excited state uh, allows for the electron transfer, which can then efficiently repair the TT dimer, just like in the previous scheme. And when we compare it to uh, the canonical uh, TTA or ATT trimer, it actually turns out that there is no energetic advantage in transferring this electron. So the excited state minimum for the electron transfer state and the locally excited state on adenine uh, is, all, well, the energy is almost the same. Uh, whereas there is significant energetic advantage for the electron transfer in uh, the modified uh, trimer containing to 6 the purine. And when you look at the electron transfer rates, these are actually ultra fast in the case of the trimers containing 2 6 the purine. Uh, so that's really the time constant which I took from, the, from this a simple calculation based on Marcus theory. Whereas when we look at the canonical uh, oligomer, it's at the level of several to, to 10 picoseconds. So we have an, a set of experimental results. So what I'll just mention vaguely is that uh, the repaired product very quickly builds up from the damaged starting material in the case of the oligomer with 206 in appearing. And we see it, first of all, by uh, UV vis. So we see increase in absorption uh, characteristic for thymine, but it was also checked by LCMS. Uh, we don't see the same or we see very little of the product in the case of the canonical trimer. So the take home message is actually that just adding one amino group can uh, give you 90% of self repair yields, whereas you see 80% of photo destruction uh, when you have the canonical uh, trimer. Uh, so it's a substantial difference. And just to, to quickly say, is actually 2,6-time in a purine prebiotically relevant? Well, it is. First of all, it, well, we, we think it is, basically. First of all, it can selectively pair with uh, uracil, just as adenine. It is only slightly less photostable, so it's nucleoside, perhaps two times less photostable than adenosine. It could still survive in the UV-rich prebiotic environment. It was shown to enhance RNA template copying. Uh, and we, in our most recent work from Nature Communications from this year, we also have, apart from the photochemical part, a proposed prebiotic synthesis of, of its nucleoside, which could be incorporated in uh, the oligomers. Uh, so one of the research di directions that we want to, to move on uh, in the future is non enzymatic RNA template copying, but uh, for the sake of time, I won't uh, talk much about it. Uh, I will just, uh, oh, that's, an, uh, that's a surprise, but no problem. Uh, I wanted also to show my group, but probably it will come out uh, on the next slide. So just to very quickly summarize, uh, the photostability of nuclear bases is likely an epiphenomenon, so it was probably not a direct reason for the selection of RNA and DNA bases. And we think that the direct reason was really electron transfer rates. Uh, and also the self-repair mechanism, which I showed to you, uh, and photochemical and the rates of photochemical transformations. Uh, and uh, another interesting result is that a very photounstable polymer might be formed, or sorry, a very photostable polymer might be formed from photounstable building blocks. So quite an unintuitive result, uh, which is directly related to uh, the photochemistry of 2,6-thymine purine. And I'll just very quickly uh, move to the composition of the group. So currently I have, uh, I work with a uh, postdoc uh, who actually was at the Institute of Physics uh, for, for some time. Uh, and she does wonderful work on, on electron transfer rates in DNA and RNA. There are also two PhD students and some undergraduates uh, who are interested in, in very similar topics. Uh, so some of the work was done by, uh, by them, especially by Mikoi, uh, who did the calculations for the nucleosides and for the nature paper. And uh, 
There are many other groups that we collaborate with uh, from many places in the world, but also from Poland. Uh, and for the sake of time, I'll finish here. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the lecture. Uh...